Hi, my name is Andreas. I'm working at the LMU uh, in the group of chromatin proteomics in the biomedical center. And uh, my presentation is about proteomics data generation, um, data analysis, and also about the uh, problems that we have with proteomics data, so missing values and how to treat them. Um, my presentation is a very broad overview of proteomics, has a basic introduction um, to the technology, and um, I think hopefully some good ways to treat the data in the end. I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for your interest in the proteomics section. So just a quick overview. There's quite some topics I'll be uh, talking about, um, especially in the beginning about the sample preparation and uh, uh, data generation, but also then the, the searching of data, uh, normalization and the missing values that we have. Um, what do we see as proteome? So a proteome is basically everything that um, is consistent of a longer chain of amino acids in the cell and um, what is important for us is also um, what are the interactions of proteins. So this means like uh, do we have a post translation modification of the protein that could alter the activity. For instance phosphorylation is uh, very important but also on a since um, I'm working with uh, chromatin, uh, we have histones, and histones are extensively modified by methylation and acetylation that can then, that's for instance, are used in the sequencing technologies to see the state of the gene if it's actively transcribed or silenced. Um, we can, we are interested if we have interactions with other molecules, mainly proteins, or with DNA, so we have a lot of technologies that uh, can analyze the protein composition of uh, antibody pull downs. And uh, also, a very big difficult topic is um, what actually can we measure synthesis and degradation of proteins uh, over time and about the localization. So, well, first of all, uh, if you have a look at proteins, protein is uh, very um, heterogeneous group of molecules. So we have very acidic proteins uh, as with a low isoelectric point or very basic proteins and a lot of it in between. So this ranges a lot. So we have to adjust the pH very well if you we want to isolate proteins. We have proteins that are embedded in membranes so they're very hydrophobic. Uh, we have proteins with unstructured regions and so on. And all this uh, makes it necessary that we add additives if we want to isolate proteins from cellular matrix. And this makes it often difficult to detect proteins directly by mass spectrometry. But that doesn't end yet. If you um, analyze a full intact protein, if you manage to measure it in a mass spectrometry, what you often will see is this. Um, this is a, a spectrum of the electrospray ionization. That's also what that's the most common coupling technique to liquid chromatography. I uh, will come to that also in a minute. And what happens is that due to the size of protein, it just uh, acquires a different amount of protons that are then reflected in different charge states. And since mass spectrometers are a bit limited in their uh, acquisition range, this protein um, already occupies about one third of it, just a single protein. So working with proteins, full-length proteins, is a bit difficult. That's why um, the bottom-up approach was developed. A uh, bottom-up approach simply says that we, um, instead of measuring the full protein, we cleave the protein to small peptides. And uh, they are much more homogeneous to work with. Uh, we have a lot of uh, separation technologies available, uh, ion-based ion interaction 
separations or reversed phase and they adopt the lower number of charge states as you will see in a minute <coughs> however if you cleave a protein to oligopeptides you obtain typically around 5 to 30 peptides so you increase your sample complexity a lot and in the end you have to reconstruct proteins from the data that you obtain of the peptides so this is how the approach usually looks like you have um, a cell, you lyse the cell, you isolate proteins with a specific buffer, um, for instance, precipitate DNA or adding DNAs, and then you add a uh, uh, protease, which is in usual cases trypsin, but could also be another very specific endoprotease that cleaves your proteins at the very specific residue. In case of trypsin, this is lysine or arginine, the basic amino acid. So we have a very specific pattern that you obtain for one protein. Then this mixture is typically um, undergoes separation. Uh, depending on the complexity of the mixture, you just go directly to the um, reverse phase separation, and this you then couple directly at the end with an electrospray to the mass spectrometer. And the good thing about having the chromatography is that we already uh, obtain our signal that we can quantify because the chromatogra uh, chromatographic peak that we obtain uh, is a measurement for the quantity of the sample. So uh, what can we expect? So if we do proteomite studies, uh, we know currently that there are more than 10,000 proteins expressed in most cell types. And uh, depending on the extensive and uh, extensivity of your analysis, you can almost reach that with proteomics. But usually if you go with very, um, very crude material to the mass spectrometer, you gain about 2,000 proteins. Um, we have a quite high order of magnitude and uh, dynamic range, and uh, that's why we often, if you're interested in one specific uh, protein or in the interactions, make a pull down, and you can already reduce that to only a thousand proteins that you usually detect in uh, such interaction studies. And a uh, very specific question is want to analyze post sensation modifications because they can be really low abundant. So this is the dynamic range of the unmodified protein can be really very high depending where the protein is localized localized and what specific function the um, post sensation modification has. So <coughs> basically this is the ionization process. Um, briefly, here we have the end of the um, column or the emitter spray tip. There we form a spray of small droplets of uh, salt that contains our peptide molecule. And while flying through uh, the gap between the column and the entrance to the mass spectrometer, we lose the solvent, and what remains is a peptide in the, the proton. And since this is a plastic process, when these droplets kind of emit uh, solvents and when peptides and also separate in the gas phase, you obtain um, different number of charge states depending very much on the size of the peptide that you have. So you also have to keep this in mind to later analyze the data that your peptide might be um, present in different charge states. And this is the um, typical look of the data. So here we have a, a the tick that runs into two chromatogram, uh, meaning that it's the sum of the intensities of all ions time. And here you have a depiction of the duty cycle of the mass spectrometer. For instance, for this time point, this 
the same over the whole time. So at first we acquire a full mass spectrum at the illusion time. And then this will give us an overview of all the uh, peptides that are present at this mixture. And then in the untargeted data dependent mass spec analysis, the mass spectrometer will look for the most intense signals. Um, determine the charge state of that signals. I will come to that in a minute. And then, if the signal is suitable, we'll perform a fragmentation analysis and acquire a fragment mass spectrum of this specific peptide because in this uh, fragmentation or MS2 spectrum, it specifically isolates this signal or the peptide underlying on the signal and then apply some energy and the peptide will fall into pieces that can be detected as ions here. Now, um, this fragmentation is not stochastic, but it happens very specifically. Uh, if you apply energy, this happens at the peptide bond. If you apply a different kind of fragmentation, this can also happen next to the uh, peptide bond. But this is the usual case that we have. It's called, called collisional induced dissociation. So we can fragment uh, every time between amino acids. And this will give us specific signals that uh, we then can reanalyze, uh, connect that mass with a specific fragment of this peptide. Um, just um, for your interest, so the data structure, then as I said, we have repeated survey scans in uh, this type of instrument, the RTQ Orbitrap, which is very common. Uh, they are run in parallel to the MSMS scans, so and they take a bit more time. And um, a certain number of uh, fragment ion scans that are uh, here run in time or in, uh, other type of instruments are just run after the um, initial survey scan. And also the data structure is like disconnected that if you then uh, use this fragment ion spectrum for identification, it looks for the precursor mass in the adjacent the, um, survey scan before. And, oh yeah, this has been used for identifying the peptide and later on the protein. <coughs> so there's um, several well, new technologies, I would say, to specifically look at the uh, one uh, protein or a subset of proteins. But I, if I want to detect them reproducibly in every sample, because the data, the data dependent analysis is very stochastic and only looks at the most intensive signals, I can use uh, the so called single reaction monitoring or multiple reaction monitoring, depends on the vendor that you use, that you choose. And with this, I give the mass spectrometer a certain list of those peptide ions that I expect, it will then um, repeatedly isolate them. Like for instance, this MSMS MS scan is always the same in every cycle. Uh, we'll fragment them and then we'll look for the, and we'll acquire the fragment. So basically what I get is I observe the fragment intensity over the whole retention time and not just at a single point when the mass spectrometer decided this peak is high enough to acquire a fragment spec. Um, however, this is um, a bit limited in the number of analytes, but provides a very good uh, quality of data. And another type that uh, was established in the recent years is a so-called SWAF technology or data independent fragmentation. And this 
is very similar, but instead of telling the instrument to analyze only one single fragment, I uh, tell the instrument to analyze a big area. It can do that, and then later on um, I can compare that to a spectral library that I have before, and can also extract ex uh, especially these uh, quantitative signals. However, um, for such samples we still have quite a lot of need to improve data analysis, but it's ongoing. And so uh, the idea is, um, well, if, if I, so this is done over the whole mass range. So basically um, those scans uh, fragment not only a single ion, but they fragment like all ions that are within uh, 20 or up to 50 uh, Dalton. So I also get reproducible spectra and then I can align the peaks in the fragment ion spectra um, over the time so I know which peaks belong to which spectrum. And then if I have a spectral library um, where I already have identified a certain spectrum, then I can go back and say, okay, this was this peptide that eluded there, and I'll basically have exactly those data for for the peptides, but for like theoretically all peptides. Yeah. But um, data analysis is there's a bit lagging behind that you get really deep into. So at the moment it is very much comparable with the data dependent approach, um, but the quantitation values are more reproducible. Uh, this, is <laughs> this is only on newer instruments like uh, QTOP can do that and uh, QExective instrument because they have high resolution. So usually for this you need a high resolution instrument. And then um, just to mention, um, post-translation modification uh, introduce also a mass shift of the peptide. It's only shown here for phosphorylation, for instance on a serine, has a certain mass shift and we can analyze data also for that if the peak occurs at this mass shift and also the fragment ions have this mass shift then it's most likely phosphorylation or acetylation and dimethylation very different. However what you could keep in mind for analyzing um, PPMs they may alter the cleavage activity of the protease. So gypsum will not cleave at this acetylysin residue. So how is data analysis done? Uh, the instrument and later on the algorithm uh, identifies this as a peptide signal and every uh, peptide signal contains of several mass spectrometry se separated peaks. They belong to natural isotopes of uh, carbon-13 because in, uh, sorry, in nature we have about 1% carbon-13 abundant, and those uh, those peaks um, then belong to uh, a species that has doesn't have carbon-13 as 1, 2, or even 3. And from the distance between the signal, it can calculate the charge state, because the difference between carbon-12 and 13 should ideally be 1. In this case, if this is uh, a distance of 0 0.5, then the charge state was 2. And the same it uh, can do with fragment ion spectra because uh, all amino acids have very specific um, mass difference. So basically what the algorithms do is they um, select for a specific precursor. I can show this here. So first of all, they extract the uh, raw data from the 
fragment ion scans and associates it to the precursor. And then they um, get a protein database, which is just a faster file. And they, in silico, perform the digestion according to the um, protease I used. So we will do that uh, hands-on session tomorrow um, a bit without starting the search. Uh, there we also can add modifications we want to look at. And then, yeah. So sometimes it does that in a way that it uh, splits the spectrum into um, small pieces and isolates and then iteratively searches for the most abundant, uh, most and second abundant and so on. And sometimes it checks the whole spectrum. And then um, in silico it generates also the fragment spectra of a list of precursors that would fit into a certain mass accuracy around the precursor chart uh, M over C that we have. And then it compares this theoretical spectrum to the data of the practical spectrum um, and creates a, basically a p-value how good or how well the spectrum fits to the theoretical spectrum. And then it ranks this uh, peptides and then you can apply a cutoff and say until this data I believe and the rest is uh, probably wrong. So um, how is this done? So at the moment, I think we're around 100, uh, around 20 different search engines. Here are the um, most common ones. Um, if you want to have a look, there are some more if you want to see. Um, we in the lab use Mascot and mainly MaxQuant, which uh, we will have a look at tomorrow. MaxQuant, because it's uh, very often updated, it's uh, freely available and it's at the moment really the um, standard machine and databases you can easily get from either Uniprot, NCBI or um, some organism related websites. Um, yeah, before you analyze the, um, when you analyze the you know, data, so we will have a look at tomorrow is something that you can do. So you can look at the peak shape of a single peptide or also of a standard that you can run in between your samples uh, to guarantee that your chromatography is uh, not affected. For instance, it could be affected that your sample um, has some impurities or detergents and then it will be shifted. Um, what you could have a look at is how much of your acquired spectra actually identified. On all the in instruments, um, you can get something up to 35% identification. The newer ones are um, a bit higher. So if your ad identification rate drops, then you will have a problem with your data. Or you have a problem with your database search, so you selected the wrong database or added the wrong uh, modification, wrong um, protease, whatever. Um, you can have a look at uh, how many data you identify. So on all the instruments, uh, like the LTQ Orbitrap that we have, um, I would say for a highly complex sample, you will reach something about this. So this is more like for uh, pull downs, but this is the maximum you can kind of get if you inject the full cell isate. Your instruments can get a, a lot higher than that. And then uh, later on, what we'll show with the number of well, with the missing values is how many of your signals can be integrated. And then depending on that, you have to change your uh, interpretation, quanti uh, quantitation setup, or maybe rerun a sample uh, or do the whole data uh, sample preparation again. So um, how does the search result usually look like? So um, what you get from this is from uh, Mascot, the kind of HTML-like result 
um, where you see the protein sequence in, head, in red highlighted which peptides have been identified and then a list of peptides. Uh, this is a very basic result. And we will work with Maxcon tomorrow. They are a bit more easier because those are um, quite difficult to get back into um, downstream analysis for quantification. Um, instead of searching it against the database of uh, theoretical proteins, what you can also do is search it against the spectral library. So if you get your actual spectrum, and those spectral libraries are already available uh, in, in the internet, uh, from like Peptide Atlas or something, those those spectral data are then searched against the library of already identified spectra of peptides. And the good thing about this is here you already have some information about the intensity of peaks, which is then related to how often the peptide breaks at a specific order. So if you have more noise in, in this, identify this um, spectrum, which is sometimes easier if you try to do it against the database. Um, there's not so much algorithms for identifying looking for the amino acid sequence from the spectrum uh, without information from any kind of database. Uh, and because that is quite difficult, especially if you don't know about modifications. So, yeah. Um, one big issue in proteomics is uh, the fast discoveries. And now first, let's first have a look at the, this picture. So this is from a study from uh, uh, Elias and Gigi in 2007. So they were looking, if you um, search for proteomic data in a database, then you usually get uh, like this distribution of, of um, hits over a quality score. So this uh, X score is um, a bit different because of the correlation to, to the theoretical spectrum. But it still means if you have a high score, then the uh, identification is very good. If you have a low score, the identification is bad. So if you search the same data set, again, completely foreign data, you get this distribution here in red. So this is called sites that are not a certain a, a spectrum associated with it. So basically what you try to avoid is that you get those peptides into your or that you get such data into your final list of peptides and proteins. Uh, because this is, uh, this is what you search against a foreign database. So the same happens now again in your forward database. In this uh, target database is that randomly a spectrum, often of lower quality, is associated to a sequence. Uh, but it doesn't really represent that sequence. That's a false positive, uh, which you cannot cannot distinguish from the real from the true positives. Um, so, what they um, developed is this um, two search strategy, or later on also one search strategy that I. Um, search against the uh, uh, reversed database. So, for instance, shown for this peptide here, I reverse the sequence of this peptide, and then I um, create a new protein, which I can call diff differently. Usually, I call it reversed sequence of that protein, and I see if I identify this uh, peptide somewhere. 
I make a mark and then I cut my data at the point where I have where I say I can still say this result is good because I know I have around one two up to five percent uh reverse sequences in that. Uh, there are also other approaches that are currently running in parallel, but are not so favored uh, with support vector machines. And have a look at this uh, publication if you want to. And then we have a second problem. Since we're working with small protein fragments, we have to recompute the protein uh, from the peptides. So if you identify peptides, um, for some peptides, like this blue one, this green one, it's very nice. They're fitting ideally only to one protein sequence in the database, so they're called unique peptides. However, there's some peptides, like this one, that occur in the, with the same sequence in another protein. So what do we do with them? Still, they identify both proteins, but usually, if we exclude, uh, if you find another peptide that is specific for, if you find peptides that are specific for each protein sequence, we certainly know that both proteins are present, so we cannot use them for quantification. A um, bit more difficult it gets if we know that this peptide sequence that we identify occurs in another protein but we don't find any peptide that is specific for this protein. What do we say? Do we say this peptide that is here only belongs to this protein and probably this is not a bundle? Or do we accept both proteins? Um, algorithms usually do in this case. In this case, they form a group of proteins and they say this is the leading proteins, protein because it has the most peptides. Um, identified. No, we are not sure. This is just the abundance of the sequence. Of course, we can have a look uh, how those proteins are composed. In most cases, or in really a lot of cases, it will be isoformed, the protein, but uh, there might be um, Initial. Yeah, and then also the the next point is um, if you identify, for instance, a peptide with a post-translation modification, which we know does not have to be a hundred percent present in the protein, um, do we use such peptides for quantification? Do we accept them or not? So, how do we quantify? So as I said, we use the uh, retention time intensity profile. Here this is shown for one uh, peptide and the isotopes. And what we quantify is the area under this curve. Um, however, the response of the peptide is not the same for each peptide sequence. So, we cannot directly say from the intensity or the area on the curve there's so much peptide in the sample. And it also depends on the uh, matrix effects and uh, ion suppression effects and so on. So to really quantify a protein, um, we decide to use a relative quantification between samples that have a very similar sample preparation and there's uh, several methods uh, that we have, uh, that we can use. So the easiest one um, used is uh, counting the number of identified spectra. That's been shown to be quite reliable, uh, but it's very difficult if you want to quantify very small differences. So for instance, if this are our samples or control in our sample, and we have the protein here in red, oh, you can see, uh, present and probably in the control, this is triggered uh, four times, gives four different identifications. 
And in the sample, we have only two peptides triggered because the other ones are below the threshold of the instrument. So we can say the protein here is less abundant. It's a bit difficult to really uh, estimate how much less. But, um, it is possible to do that. What is actually more accurate and also more often used is to use this big area. And that's why we um, integrate, but there you have to be careful uh, about the matrix effects. Um, and another thing that um, we have is we're quantifying between different uh, runs and usually we acquire maximally around 20 samples per day but uh, depending on a sample it could also only be two or three so you might have a lot of batch effects to acquire over a long time uh, but on the other hand if you do your sample prep very well this is a uh, quite cheap and you don't need to additionally introduce any kind of standard um, because you just use the data that you have to normalize. And there also we, we are at a problem um, that Franz mentioned, so also in proteomics you have um, column aging. So here I just show you some uh, signals that belong to the same peptide and it's uh, actually from the Sotega project and you see that this is a very early sample that we measured uh, and also a bit later samples and you see that those peaks are considerably shifted like this for almost 20 minutes in the end and we have to correct that and then we also we can uh, either use the data itself to align the samples and so this is automatically done by MaxCon um, to a certain extent or we can add uh, we can create a specific database for that this can we do this we can do in, in other um, programs so that we can use Skyline or you can add a specific standard to that so if you say it's a bit risky to quantify between different runs and I have the possibility to completely label my sample metabolically. You can uh, do that uh, or chemically. You can do that within a single run. Because the mass spectrometer uh, separating different masses, uh, you can uh, create a, a sample that is heavier than the normal sample by a specific introduction of uh, heavy amino acids, they will shift the signal and I get two sets of signals that I can quantify. Uh, and then I can also already within the same sample uh, calculate my intensity ratios relative between control and sample. Um, this is a bit uh, different for MS-MS based quantitation. Um, so there we have uh, again the MRM or SWOF data. They are usually label free, so they work only in between runs. And here you can see uh, just a subset how that looks like. You can also introduce specific standards if you want. Or we have uh, isobaric labeling methods. And it's also kind of isotopic labeling, but instead of getting two signals in the mass we get an uh, uh, array of signals in the fragmentation spectrum which uh, peak area we then can use to quantify up to at the moment eight different samples at the same time from the same LCMS run. So this is just an overview for you uh, about the methodologies. So the idea of um, labeling is that you combine the samples at a very early stage. So if you metabolically label samples of if cells, uh, cell cultures or animals, you can um, already combine them and then do the whole 
downstream protocol of fractionation, uh, digestion, and data analysis together. So you don't have any much bias from, from the analysis. Um, also the same happens for chemical labeling. While for label free, you have to be really careful that nothing happens during this process that introduces a bias here. Of course, it's very difficult to calculate them back. So, yeah, as I said, the quantification is uh, usually how do we quantify proteins? So we usually um, either use the sum of peak areas or intensities or the number of spectra, as I said, or we use a, a median of peak areas or, for instance, with labeled samples of ratios. Also, sometimes the average is used in, in older versions. However, especially if you use the sum method, uh, this is biased towards the protein length because a longer protein will generate more peptide fragments. So in the end, you will uh, get up more data points for this protein, and probably very small proteins might not be represented very much in this data set. However, you should keep an eye on uh, integration errors, but with most data sets, this is um, very difficult because we have like a lot of data, a lot of uh, individual data sets, so you might not be able to um, look through a lot of signals. And then what is a, a big problem in um, the untargeted data dependent proteomics is the missing values. So if you run one biological replicate, you get a certain view of your proteome. If you run the next replicate, the overlap is rather small. Uh, don't be surprised, it could be something between 40 to 70 percent overlap. This is already very good. And the more samples you run, the less gets your overlap. So this is a, a, a big issue. You can kind of try to overcome that. Uh, there are algorithms that you can still try to find peak intensities in the data where you did not identify the protein. Uh, but usually they're, they're only successful to a certain extent. Uh, usually it's lower abundant data that I'm missing. And uh, depends on the intensity, on the abundance. So if it's lower abundant, it will be more likely to be missing in the next run. If you have something that is very high abundant, you will find it in the next sample as well. And then it's also how do you treat this uh, samples. So if you get your final data set also with the um, matching of peak between between runs, um, you still have the choice to say, okay, do I completely omit everything that has a missing value because I cannot account for its correctness. But that you will probably lose some important proteins that you're looking at. Um, you have a possibility to impute that. Um, however, there you have to be careful not to do that for um, a huge part of your data set. Or you can try to impute the value by um, yeah, getting an idea how good this or how abundant this protein was in other replicates or if you, for instance, have other data types that you can use. So, yeah, finally we get to statistical analysis. Uh, heat test is still the most common. 
that we do also some samples uh, just on Nova or oh, then uh, like um, Stratega exploring Lima and Masic Pro functional analysis I think you will learn or you know um, can associate proteins to genes and gene ontologies cake pathways and so on so uh, just something specific if you look at proteomic data what is still often used if you have two samples is um, a volcano plot which actually shows you the fold change in the relative fold change between the two samples and the significance of that fold change okay with this uh, I'd like to thank my group in Munich uh, you can see us with our early spring uh, late winter activities and you for your attention.